Hey guys, welcome to The Bottom Half is Red. I'm your host, Baron Longstrath, and I am excited to bring to you a show that is going to give you some thought-provoking discussions. It's going to give you some expert insights to both encourage and some practical steps for how to build an organization that can more effectively introduce the world to Jesus Christ. So what is the bottom half is red? It's all about building a culture of excellence. It's about growing your unique and creative identity. And it's about carrying out the will of God at any cost. So you're gonna see that through practical teaching tips, developing a culture of giving, creating branding and marketing, or even methods to help guests feel safe and welcomed. This podcast is gonna have you covered. But before we dive into today's episode, I wanna take just a moment and extend a special invitation to all of our dedicated listeners. If you're looking to get even more involved in our community and gain some access to some behind the scenes stuff, become a Patreon supporter. And you can find that link in the episode description or even on Patreon, just visit the bottom half is red. Listen, we can't wait to welcome you on board and to share this exciting journey. Now, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, welcome again to the bottom half is red. We are excited to have each and every one of you join us today. We have a fantastic episode planned for our audience, and I am excited about bringing on our guest today, a very, very good friend of mine. In fact, it would probably be easy to say that he would be my best friend and um, just a passionate leader. Justin Anthony, pastor of Bethel Christian Ministries in Bellevue, Nebraska. Pastor Justin, we're so excited to have you on the show today. Excited to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, if you have ever met Pastor Justin, you're going to know that this is probably one of the most creative men that you have ever met. Um, One of the most exciting, innovative I think innovative is a good term for you, Pastor Justin, not only just in what you do, but in life itself. And I could say that you are an innovative person because I have been with you not only um, here in our local assembly or at your local assembly, but I have had the privilege of traveling the world with you in various capacities. And I have seen you no matter what nation I have seen you in your innovation. I've seen you be able to make things happen. And uh, if you want to meet a guy that can make things happen, you need to meet Pastor Justin Anthony. And uh, we're glad to have him on the show today. And I know you've served in various capacities. You've served overseas. Am I correct on that? Yes, sir. You've been in two different... um, uh, two different regions. You were in the Philippines. And how long were you in the Philippines? I served in the Philippines as an aimer under missionary David Brott um, for nine months. So I taught Bible school there. So it was a great, great opportunity. And then I served also in a leadership development international uh, with you, actually, the very right. first time uh, we traveled overseas together right. uh, as the Timothy and Titus. Uh, we were assigned to maybe try to impart or just share ministry and leadership with uh, the younger uh, generation of pastors that are uh, upcoming in in the Filipino um, ministry and work there. And you did some work. I know your dad was in the military. You did some work in Germany as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. I attended high school uh, in West Germany, in southern Western Germany. And uh, so that was a great experience and exposure. We did some we were involved in the local church there. And then because of that, my folks were always uh, very, very committed to Christ wherever they were. So just met some incredible missionaries in the in the late 80s. And so it was well, a great, great experience. I, you're docking your age crazy. now, bro. You're docking your age I now. <laughs> I am. I am. You're, I should say your experience. You're docking your experience yes. now. Uh, which brings me to a great point. You said that... I think you gave honor to your parents, but um, they definitely passed down the trait. And your passion is people. Your mission is the gospel. And you have created in your local assembly as a fantastic leader, you have created a dynamic church culture. And you have been pastoring now. It's two decades plus. Am I correct on that? 23 years full time. So 23 years full time. And so I've been a part of your congregation now, 
I don't know, a dozen or more times. And um, each time I'm always impressed by the type of culture that has been created there at BCM, if you'll allow me to call it BCM. But the content that we're going to bring today is specific. And I've asked him um, to lay out what he feels like would be three things that every culture must have and share with us some uh, practical, some innovative, take us down the direction on what you feel like. And there will be various times in this conversation we might jump in together and, and push a little bit. Well, again, thank you. I consider you also my best friend. I want to throw that in there. And you and your family have just been incredible to me. I'm already um, fighting back emotional responses in, in, inside of me because I'm honored to be a part of this friendship, but then a part of just the kingdom of God. Yeah. And I feel like I recognize where I am and at least a little bit. And, and let me just say this, that that I'm standing in the middle of the flow of, of the Spirit of God, and it didn't start with me, and it's not going to end with me. That where I am today is very much a product of who set cultures and things in motion in my life before I even stepped into the ministry and the calling where God has That's a great point. set me. And I've always said that the church is not an F-16 where you are just going to turn it on a dime. It is the product of the ministries, the God-given voices that have governed. And this is a spiritual journey. And so the church is more along the lines of a Titanic. And sometimes to affect change in culture and affect things, uh, number one, you have to stare at the, at the bank to even see, are you moving? Are you turning? Is the direction turning? So culture to me is a very difficult thing uh, to say, yes, I'm going to change it or grab a hold of it. But by the help and the grace of God, uh, there are things that he has put in my spirit that I can add to the flow, that I can add to the current that I'm already in and so thankful to be in. So the anointings, the presence of God, the things that are important to us at, at our local God family, they didn't start with me, but I see the value of those things. And I want to do my part to continue to put the right emphasis on the right things so that when Jesus comes back, there will be a people ready for the coming of the Lord. So that's kind of my, my take. But three things every culture must have. Um, when, I, when I thought about that, I don't use the word culture a lot. So I'm thankful for the, the challenge, the mental challenge to look at that, to define that, to try to wrap my fingers around that. When I thought about culture, I thought about the umbrella that covers behavior, the behavior of a group of people, a set of norms. I think culture also becomes the guardrails of thought and action, uh, guiding and governing organization or church. I think about culture as aiding in the steering of the vision and the setting of expectations. I think it, it's interwoven into everything. Who, who are we? Who, who are we? Who do we want to become? What are we shooting for? So the uh, three things that every culture must have, first and foremost, uh, would be, first of all, a shared definition of greatness. The second would be a shared sense of priority. Mm, that's good. And then the third uh, would be a shared belief. So those three things, I think, would set the culture, a shared definition of greatness, a shared sense of priority, and a shared belief. Those three things would be what I would say every culture would need. We're excited about hearing it. Um, and I, I want you just to dive in. Yeah, absolutely. I want to preface to say the first two things that I'm going to talk about as far as culture, I attribute not to myself, but to my father and bishop, Elvin Anthony, who modeled these things in himself personally. And and that man of God actually impacted the culture of Bethel Christian Ministries and impacted me so that it is the guardrails. It's the, it's the visioneering of Justin Anthony and what he, what he views is, is, is priority. So the first, the first thing I want to say is the first culture is uh, a shared definition of greatness. Everybody wants to be great. Everybody, 
everybody wants to be noticed. Everybody wants to make a difference, I think, in humanity. Mm. But I think a shared definition of greatness in, in, in the context of Bethel Christian Ministries, what is greatness? And then what are we reaching for? No matter who you are, what, what does that look like? What does it mean to excel? What does it mean to, to really achieve and to succeed? I, I want to do that. I think most everybody that I'm around, they have this innate desire to do something of value and worth and to become something of value and worth. And so uh, our definition of greatness determines our thoughts. Our definition of greatness determines our actions. I believe simply our definition of greatness determines our ideals. And so I, I direct our hearts and minds to a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples because they also wanted to do great things for the kingdom of God. And, and Jesus pointed out that the culture of the Gentiles or the culture of the world is much different than the culture of Christ. Um, truly, the, the world has greatness upside down, according to Jesus. Uh, there must be a commitment to developing right side up greatness in my mind and my spirit, especially in, in the local church. Jesus said it this way, whoever exalts himself will be abased, and whoever abases himself will be exalted. And Jesus looked at his disciples, the men that would change the world. He said, look, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Mm. He defined greatness. Baron, he, de he defined, what are you shooting for, Peter? What are you shooting for, Paul? And he said, if, if you need an example, look at me. L look at me. I'm your great. I'm, I'm, I'm greater. I'm superior in every facet and in every way. I'm the God of glory. And yet, I didn't come to be ministered to. I came to minister. And so I, I feel like my father modeled this. I feel like it's not saying that he, he didn't have worth or value, but his estimation of greatness was serving others, mm -hmm. servant leadership. And I have watched that, that simple definition of greatness. I have watched that man of God absolutely steer the church in times of great turmoil, in times of, of disagreement. In leadership, there will be disagreement. But the one thing you could not argue about my father is that he he was not trying to be better in your eyes. He was trying to serve you. Mm. Whether you agreed with him or not, his decisions were not motivated by personal uh, you know, pedestals or trying to reach the next level. It was simply, I want to be like Christ. So this Christ-likeness, this this idea, this commitment to say, the greatest among you shall be your servant. He modeled biblical greatness better than anyone I know. And, and I, I look at that today, Baron, and I think, God, what am I shooting for? You know, what, what, am, what am I pointing the leaders in the church to be like? Who's the hero of the church? It's not me. It's Christ. Who's the one that we're to keep our eyes on? It's Christ. And, and which is greater, being first or last? Well, in the culture of Christ, it's last. Which, which is greater? Which is greater? Being honored or honoring? Which, which is greater in that culture? Honoring others. It's not receiving, but it's giving. Which, which, is, which is greater? Being lifted up or lifting up? But in order to lift up, you got to be under. Yeah. It didn't say pull them up. It said lift them up. Uh, which is greater? Being served or serving? So what other organization you're in, I don't really care if it is a uh, you know, a secular organization and leadership. I'm going to tell you, if you treat people right, you, there's always going to be people that abuse the system. There's all, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like redefining your definition of greatness. That's a great point, bro. That's such a great point. So yeah, the first thing is, is striving to be great. Absolutely. Strive to be great. Give it your best. Do it with all of your heart. But what are you shooting for? Mm. So the, the, the result of having and creating this, this idea, this, this, this shared definition of greatness, I believe it in organization, it absolutely promotes teamwork instead of leadership emphasis. No, I like that, Justin. That's super good. Would you push on that a little bit? So, so the, the idea of teamwork is, is that, you, you know, we're all in this. We all have a role to play. We all have something to do. Uh, and, and we don't necessarily look to the leader as the hero. Everybody's got a role to play. It de I think it de-emphasizes who's the best and who's the greatest. It, it takes out the, this idea of we're in competition. Right. <laughs> if anything, we're trying to deal with ourselves, to press ourselves to a level. And I think in an organization and in leadership, when everybody's trying to, to, to make sure that they're putting others first, people orientation, I think, I think that really, really does help us arrive 
at an ability to use our strengths and talents to the betterment of the whole in a in a much easier environment rather than strive striving against egos personalities all of those things i think the surrender of those things and just the bringing to the table everything that we possess for the betterment for the moving in a certain direction that's what i think unity is really really about that's what that's what i think the unity of the church is about is everybody not thinking more highly of themselves than they ought that's not saying that hey i don't have an incredible role to play but uh, you know in in achieving this christ likeness I, I believe it just the the mood the willingness to forgive the willingness to walk in the personal commitment to christ and the reactions to people around us leadership and it's all about influence. Leadership is about forgiving one another. Leadership is about learning how to deal with people. The morale, I think, of people, uh, if if we can create this kind of culture. So I hope I hope uh, that makes sense. No, it does. So I mean, what I'm gaining from this is a you know you have a Naboth type understanding that I didn't create this land. In fact, it, it's more of an inheritance than anything else. Yeah. I'm right. going to make this as, as best I can as long as I'm here. I'm going to keep the greatness, the aim for greatness. You've explained biblical greatness, um, what that does, how we stand on the bank and look out, and then how greatness affects a culture and how it has steered the culture. And then you've laid out this principle of serving and no greater to me no greater example than the life of jesus christ as he literally shifts his ministry towards the final thrust right and he knows that calvary is just hours away and yet he says listen this is a type of greatness that i'm going to exhibit where is the bowl where is the towel where is the water mm -hmm. And he begins the process of saying, I'm going to show you what kind of culture is going to change the world. And he washes their feet, right? And this greatness that is going to shift and change the world is through loving, serving, giving, so, so on and so forth. And bro, you're giving some incredible meat here that we all need to have we need to plunge ourselves into. I'm loving what you're talking about, Pastor Jay. Yeah, thank you. Um, absolutely right, man. I'm just in, I, I want to continue in that vein that I've been handed and say, God, it's amazing that 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 Christ started this culture of Christianity, and the basis and foundation of it was servanthood. All right, so uh, Pastor Justin, let me ask you a question here. You made a great statement here, and you said that you were somebody that inherited the example was laid out before you i know that your your dad pastored and then your father-in-law prior to him and so we know that there were uh generational investments being made uh, of what you said were contributing to greatness what are you presently doing right now as let's call it a leg in this relay how are you running this race personally so that somebody following you is going to be able to say this is what pastor justin was doing in terms of greatness can you give us some practical ways that you're making investments into or even biblical applications what are you doing now great yes so i always start with a mirror instead of a window mm. because i believe that the word of god is first and foremost given to me as a mirror to to make sure that justin anthony walks in a, a way that exemplifies I, I don't think that the that the sense of greatness or a shared definition of greatness is an earthly concept i believe it's a heavenly concept and so the very first thing is to look in the mirror and say okay justin um are you living this life are you modeling this as a leader and so i feel like leadership first and foremost ha is given the responsibility of modeling trying your best to keep yourself at a place uh of pursuing the biblical definition of greatness because i can get off track mm. i can get uh, my eyes 
on something else that really is driven by something. So number one, I keep, I, I try to keep my eyes on it. And what I find is, is that everything flows out of that. If Justin is at the right spot, then the way I talk to people, the way I respond to challenges and issues, the way I uh, look at the future then is through that lens. And so everything they say rises and falls on leadership. And so I believe that number one, it starts with me. Number two is I don't look for talent. I look for the heart of people. That's good. Because no matter how talented people are, if they miss this shared definition of greatness, it will absolutely pollute. Can I use that word? Yeah. The environment of ministry in a culture. It's a toxin in the structure and in a system. I'm not saying they're an enemy. I'm saying that that spirit, Jesus had to deal with that spirit. And so rather than looking at somebody's talent, I am trying to build a culture inside of leadership people because their abilities grow and shift and their desires over time change. So if somebody starts in youth ministry, they're not going to, I always tell them, you're not always going to be in youth ministry. You're not always going to serve here. That's not, that's not the height of what God has called you to do. It's a season in your life. It's a season in your ministry. So you don't marry the season, marry marry Christ, marry these things. And so I try to, rather than get so positionally oriented and focused, I try to say, okay, here's a person. Do they have, can I develop inside of them this uh, shared definition of greatness? And so I want to highlight, hey, that's great behavior. Hey, man, that is incredible the way you said that. So looking at ways to call out, award the modeling of greatness, the, the, the preferring of other people, the uh, that Christ likeness inside of the leader is something that needs to be highlighted, needs to be accentuated, pointed out. I ask questions. What, you know, the old question, what would Jesus do? Or how would Jesus respond to this? He's the greatest leader of all. So, you know, really pointing people back to uh, the example, trying to put in front of them an award, uh, proper greatness response. Mm. The second culture is a shared sense of priority, a shared sense of priority. This is also modeled by my father, Bishop Elvin Anthony. And I kind of alluded to it in our conversation earlier, but maybe uh, dive down a little bit into this shared sense of priority. Right relationships have got to come first. Right relationships first, then processes and structures. Right relationships first, then brick and mortar. Mm. So it's people, not processes. So you focus on people first. You ensure that yes. it's it's all about people. Then you build your systems around that. Correct. Is that what you, okay. Correct. People, not buildings. People, not performance. People over presentation. We live in a culture that puts so much emphasis on performance and will sacrifice people. We'll literally kill people in the process of a performance because we're afraid of what it looks like. It's what happens when we're living in an image-driven culture. Mm. We sacrifice what is truly important over the superficial. And sometimes we just mow so close in our organizations. We, we trim things Absolutely. so close and at the point of pressure being placed in the wrong areas. And we're pushing people to extremes instead of, I mean, we are in, Justin, we're in the people business. Like if, if you are. are a leader, you most likely are in the people business. And so how difficult it would be for us to, to think that we're going to be able to build in our area of influence on processes instead of on people. Wow. That's a great point. That's a great, great point. So I, I believe, and this is what I've said for years in pastoring, I believe there's a coming a day when the way we do church will shift mm. and force, shift of force and necessity. And the systems and the processes that we rely on now will cease to be available or even effective in those environments. And so what we think is the culture is actually just a prop for our generation. So we have got to grab a hold of a shared sense of priority. What is the church about? It's not about sound. It's not about 
it's, it's not about cameras. It's not, it's about people. And we will use everything that we have at our disposal, but that comes second to people. And I think if people, I think if people in leadership, if we understand the priority is people, I, I think we'll, we'll go a lot farther because people aren't just something to help us get to a destination. No, this is the destination. The body of Christ is the destination. Right. And so uh, the guiding factor for the church will be their commitment to spiritual and physical well-being of each other. So rules plus regulations minus relationship equals rebellion and resentment. Whew, say that. Say that one more time. Say that slower so, so guys like me can, can grasp it. Say it one more time. Rules plus regulations minus relationships equals rebellion and resentment. Mm. That's not original with me. No, it's good though. But it's true. It's true. It's good. Pure and honest heart before talent. That's what I say. That's priority. Pure and honest heart before talent. This is not America's got talent. This is church's got character. <laughs> That's good. Jesus Christ came to seek and save the lost. In order to accomplish this, there were rules and regulations that had to be satisfied, but the driving factor was relationship. Yeah. I, I, real quick, personal, uh, personal reference. I'd gotten aggravated as pastor. I was right and, and somebody else was wrong. And man, I went to prayer on it and I was just arguing, God, God, they are wrong. And he asked me this question. I believe to be the Lord. He said, do you want to be right or do you want to be reconciled? Do you want to be able to stand up and say you are right? Or do you want to say, hey, at whatever it costs for reconciliation, because Christ has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And no matter what your leadership influence is, that is a principle that can cross pollinate anywhere. Anywhere. I have never, I have never lost, Pastor Justin. I have never lost saying I'm sorry. Never. I have never lost trying to reconcile a relationship. Never. I've never lost. <sighs> And I'm not saying I haven't lost relationships, but I personally have never lost in trying to reconcile. I have lost mm -hmm. in trying to be right. Yes. At the end of the day, we are never more like Jesus than when we fight to restore and build up relationships at personal cost. Wow. In fact, reconciliation costs somebody something. Always. And it's that cost that causes people to love you, not your talent. Mm. And that's the kind of culture you want. Yes. That's the kind of culture in an organization. The last one, a shared belief that everyone has something to contribute to the kingdom of God and the glory of God. This, this, is, what I, this is what I gained from one of the greatest leaders that I believe that God brought into my life, and that's Bishop David Broad. Mm. He looked at people that, that everyone was able to contribute to the kingdom of God. We are better together. We, we can do more together. There is no question. There, there is no question which minister is more important. In fact, that question doesn't exist. Yeah. We are the body of Christ. There are no unimportant parts. We know this. So what's your role? That's what I ask people. So what did God bring you here for? Because Bethel Christian ministry will be better when you find what God has put you here for and then do it with all your heart. It's important for me to do what I do, but I am no more important than you in this thing called the body of Christ. And shifting this realization that everybody matters. That's your slogan. Hmm. Hey, you matter to the body of Christ. You matter in ministry. You matter in, in, in who you are and what you bring to the table. When we are all functioning in a God-given places, we grow to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. But that takes everybody finding who they are and then leveraging it for the glory of God. A leadership commitment to see, to encourage, and to develop each individual so they can shift from being a consumer to a contributor. Right. Our culture right now produces consumers, but the kingdom of God is not a kingdom of consumers. It's a kingdom of contributors. I used to always say, takers eat better, but givers sleep better. <laughs> I want to elevate people. That's so it is good. more blessed to give than to receive. Give, it shall be given unto you, pressed down. There is a lid on every believer because they don't realize that you, there is nothing, Baron, you know this, there is nothing like knowing that you were used by God right, for an eternal purpose. I'm telling you, that's a fuel. I don't have to bring an air pump to pump people up. I don't have to say, oh man, you really need to get involved. If they can just taste the purpose 
of being used by God, even in making a phone call, you know, picking up the phone. Hey, God. Hey, you know, Fred, man, I just felt by the Lord, man, I want to call you and tell you that God loves you. And and you didn't realize that he is having one of the hardest days ever had in his life. And you realize and you connect the dot. God just used me to encourage. Or you pull out a $50 bill just because you were like, man, I feel like I need to give Baron 50 bucks. I ain't going to go very far, Baron. But I'm going to give Baron 50 it. bucks. And that, and that person says, oh, my God, I just prayed. God, I need $50. The feeling that you were used supernaturally by God, I think tops any physical earthly experience you will ever experience in your life. And so that, that shared belief that everyone has something to give. And if you can just get them to understand your fulfillment in life is not in receiving, but in giving because God's going to use you. And that. That kind of culture just, I think, will explode. And that is awesome. Thank you so much for joining us on The Bottom Half is Red. Uh, Listen, I hope you have enjoyed your time with us today and gained something of value. If you love what you heard today, please do not forget to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. This helps us. Your feedback is incredibly crucial and we want to improve on what we're doing and to bring you the best content possible. You can find us on Facebook, look us up, Instagram, even YouTube at the bottom half is red. Hey, be sure to check the episode description for any links to any resources that we have mentioned during the show. You don't want to miss out. This podcast is a production of The Church Today here in the great city of Tulsa, and the executive producer is our very own David Tandra. I hope you've had a fantastic time, and we look forward to having you with us again on our next episode of The Bottom Half is Red. We'll see you then.